Hello, IHH lovelies. It is Tuesday night midnight, although I admit it won't be by the time this hits your ears. But it's late and I'm all tapped out of creativity, so I messaged a few friends and asked them to do my intro for me. This is the first one. Hi, I'm Carmen. I've been asked to do a guest intro for the wonderful Kate. And this is It Happened Here, a true crime podcast. I submit this and the ones to follow as proof that you can, in fact, talk about true crime endlessly and still have real friends. Thanks, Carmen. Before we get deep into the fingerprints and alibis that have been keeping me up all week, a quick shout out to my new and wonderful patrons. First up is Melanie Hillier. Thank you so much, Melanie. So cool to have you on board. And then Dylan Edwards. Thanks, Dill. I really appreciate it, and I promise to only spend your first month's contribution on beer. And then we have our second top-tier patron ever, a second H for hero, Melissa McBain. Dude, thank you so much. In addition to being awesome and having me forever in her debt, Melissa gets to pick a case for me to cover as part of her Patreon rewards. I have also noticed that we now have two Melanies and two Melissas who have pledged support via our Patreon page. Clearly undeniable proof of the excellent Mel's the world over. Today we are travelling back to the historic student town of Stellenbosch. Stelis, as it's often called, is a place with a complicated history and legacy. But for today at least we're skipping right over that and finding ourselves in a rather innocuous an unassuming corner of it. A small development of flats called Shiraz. Remember, this is wine country, hence the name. Painted in a colour that can only be described as greige, with white trim, Shiraz gives the overriding impression of neatness and functionality rather than design flair. Inside, the flats are just as simple, with open-plan kitchen lounges, white cupboards, and mottled beigey cream tiles. This is one of those gated complexes that promises security and so-called lock-and-go living. There are so many nearly identical apartment complexes all over South Africa, where this kind of development offers residents a sense of security in the face of our endlessly depressing crime stats. Still, an occupant of Flat 21 in 2005, in Galotz, had wanted to be sure. So before she moved in, she made sure to have burglar bars installed on all the windows and to put security gates on the doors in white to match the feel of the complex. These kinds of things are designed to be a barrier against the danger that lurks outside, but sadly, they present no trouble to the threats that we let into our homes. This is episode 12 of It Happened Here, Unlocked and Unsolved, The Murder of Inga In 2005, these flats had just been completed, and the first set of tenants were moving in, including 22-year-old student Inga Lotz. Inga was whip-smart, studying mathematics and stats at the University of Stellenbosch, where her father was a professor. She was gorgeous and well-liked, a talented singer with a circle of close friends and a strong relationship with her parents. She was also quite a serious and dedicated student who liked to stick to a schedule for her academic work. So when she wasn't answering her phone on the night of 16 March, her mum, Juanita, assumed that she was head down in a book. Inga's boyfriend, Fred Friend of Favour, however, was not as convinced. He'd been trying to reach Inga for a few hours, first texting and then calling. He was living with a friend in Cape Town, about 40 minutes away, so when he started to worry, his housemate Marius Boerta called someone he knew, Christo Pretorius, who lived nearby, and sent him to check things out at Shiraz. Fred jumped in his car and headed in Juanita's direction. He wanted to collect a spare remote control that she had for the security gate at the entrance of the complex. Around this time, Christo gets to Shiraz. He rings the buzzer for her flat a few times, 
but there's no reply. So he catches the attention of a neighbor standing on his balcony, tells him he's checking on a friend, and gets himself buzzed in. Now at Inga's front door, no one is answering his knocking either. He peers through the window and can tell that the TV is on, but nothing much beyond that. So he tries the door, which surprisingly swings open unlocked. From the front door, he steps into the little kitchenette with a clear view of the lounge and sees a figure lying on a couch, her hair draped over the armrest facing away from him. As he gets closer though, it's quickly clear that she's not sleeping or worse, unconscious. Instead, there's a deep and bloody wound on her forehead, another on her chest. There's blood on her face and neck and her shirt is soaked in it. It's pooled into the fabric of the white couch and there's a fine spray of blood droplets on the neat white lampshade and on those simple mottled tiles. It's evident that Inga is dead. In fact, Christo's first assumption is that Inga has killed herself. So he backs out of the flat and goes to find the friendly neighbour who had buzzed him in. The neighbour calls the cops while Christo rings Marius back. Meanwhile, Juanita is fretting at home. She's handed the remote to Fred but a short while later goes back outside, just sort of pacing around out of sheer tension and frustration. There, she sees Fred is still inside his car, and she goes to him to ask him what's happening. Around then, Marius arrives and breaks the worst possible news. Inga has been found, and she has been murdered, he says, inside 21 Shiraz. I'm going to skip ahead a little now and talk about what we know from police and forensic reporting presented later in court. I'll come back to the 16th of March a little later. At first, just one policeman is sent out and he can tell right away that this is not a suicide. So he calls in the detectives and forensic teams. When the cops arrived at the flat that night, Inga was on the couch wearing her pyjamas and looking to all the world that she'd been lying there peacefully reading a magazine when she'd been suddenly struck and murdered. If you could magic away the carnage, she lay in a relaxed pose, head against her armrest, her feet on the couch and and her legs splayed open. But we know that despite the appearance that that position creates, she had, in fact, suffered an incredibly violent attack. Here's the gory bit, if you want to skip ahead, about a minute. Inga had been struck at least 13 times on the head and face with a blunt object. Likely a hammer, according to the district surgeon, Dr. Rachel Ardenorf. She also had 17 stab wounds to her neck, and they were what was described as gouge wounds on her chest, as well as an injury to her hand, a broken metacarpal, that suggested she had tried to shield herself from some of the blows. Dr. Edendorf testified that Inga died of the head wounds as there was little bleeding from the stab wounds, meaning that her heart had stopped pumping by that stage. Her skull was effectively pulped in the attack. The gouging wound in her chest was large, about 10 centimetres in width, and the doc said it looked like it had been made with repeated movements, a kind of stabbing then dragging downward movement. There were two severed ribs and her lungs had been pierced by the stabbing implement. Finally, the doc also said that Inga had a broken nose, saying she looked like she'd been hit with a fist. This is pretty ghastly, I'm sorry, but I wanted to include these details because it is evidence of a frenzied overkill type attack, which spooky bitches the world over know is often albeit not exclusively, associated with a personal attack, not typically associated with a robbery-gone-wrong type situation. Stabbing post-mortem, for example, is not a pragmatic step, but usually violence motivated by a kind of directed rage. The surgeon paints a picture of a sustained attack, but as I said, this is quite incongruous to the scene at the flat itself, which is neat, especially this one detail that I struggle to make sense of. The magazine I mentioned before was open, positioned on her feet, which were up on the couch cushions. I've added a sketch of the position she was found in to the IHH Instagram page. I got this from a website called truthforinga.com, which I will talk about 
in some more detail later. The link is in the show notes along with all the other sources. There was a drop of blood on the magazine, which indicates that it had been open at the time of the attack. But despite the thrashing and the repeated blows to her chest, as well as the fact that she had tried to protect herself, at least in the beginning, the mag was still perched in place on her feet. I don't know exactly what that tells us, but it is a detail that feels significant to me and to others who have told this story. One of those people is Anthony Altbecker. His book Fruit of a Poison Tree was one of my key sources for this episode. Right in the beginning of the book, he writes about the problem of the magazine, as it stands for investigators and forensic analysts like Superintendent Johannes Koch. It's a great summary of all the things we know and can't know about the magazine, so I'm just going to read it. He writes, quote, Koch could not be completely certain about whether the magazine lying across Inga's feet was in that precise position at the time of the murder. There was a small drop of blood on one of the pages that was probably projected from one of her wounds by the force of the blow, and there were no marks beneath the magazine. Those findings made it quite possible that the magazine was on Inga's feet when she was killed and caused the bloodless shadow beneath it. By the same token, however, there were similar spots of blood on the coffee table, so the magazine could have been moved there after the murder. End quote. Anthony's book is on Amazon, by the way, so if you want to read more, it's easy enough to find. A few of the other things we know about the state of the crime scene include the detail that her phone and keys and all other valuables were left untouched in the flat. There was blood evidence found in the bathroom basin and on towels in the bathroom, suggesting that the killer had made at least some effort to clean themselves up before leaving the flat. We also know that several fingerprints were lifted from various sources, but surprisingly few considering that this was a home. In the end, there are 11 prints collected and sent for analysis. Inside the bathroom, as I said, there is a discarded towel with watery blood marks. And with the use of some technology, the police are also able to isolate a shoe print. So the cops have their forensics. And now they start to look for what might fit, including the process of creating a timeline for the day and the days leading up to her murder, as well as starting to plot out the relationships in her life. There was zero evidence of a break-in or robbery, so almost immediately the cops felt they were looking for someone who knew Inga. And their investigation would soon narrow down dramatically, looking at Fred for this horrible attack. Here's what we know. Inga is the only child and has a great relationship with her folks. She lives just 30 minutes away from the home, so she often spent weekends chilling at the house with the family dog and her parents. The weekend before her death had followed this pattern. She went home on the Friday and spent some quality time with her mom before Fred joined them for a night. Fred and Inga had been friends for about a year and dating for several months. Her folks liked him, and he often stayed over at their house, but in a spare room, as Inga, her parents, and Fred were all devout Christians. It was a typical weekend, but looking back, Juanita describes a few moments that have perhaps taken on greater significance with hindsight. For example, when Inga was swimming on Friday afternoon, Juanita noticed a few bruises on her arm and asked her about them. She just shrugged them off. When Fred was there and Inga started packing for the week ahead, her mom suggested she pack a little sundress because the weather was going to be so hot that week. Fred made a comment that just didn't sit well with Yanita. He told Inga, you had better only wear that dress around me. It's pretty evident in this retelling that Yanita had early misgivings about the state of her daughter's relationship at that point. And Fred admits that it was a bit of a tense time for them. The night before her murder, they'd had a fight. Just words, as far as anyone knows. And she'd actually taken the time to write him a long letter to smooth things over, reassuring him of her love and commitment. On the day of her death, she has a few classes and runs some errands. She had lunch with a friend, and she tells him about the fight that she had with Fred. 
In his telling of this, she was wondering about the future of that relationship. She chats to her mom in the early afternoon, confirming that a tiler had been around to replace a broken tile on her balcony. She tells her mom that she's going to relax for a few hours and then get back to the books that evening. We know from her receipts that she also buys lunch at Steers just before three, then pops into a grocer for a magazine and a drink before renting a DVD from a place in the same shopping centre at about 3pm. The centre is just on the road from her flat, just a few minutes' drive essentially, putting her at home around 3.30. For you, Anita and the cops, a picture is starting to emerge of a controlling and jealous boyfriend with access and means. On April 15th, they search Fred's car and find a small ornamental hammer, My first thought on reading that was, what the bloody hell is an ornamental hammer? It's a double-sided half-hammer, half-bottle opener that Fred had been given by Inga's parents as a gift. It strikes me as one of those man gifts, the kind you find at an old-fashioned tobacconist or perhaps on display in a man cave-style bar area. Not to be an arsehole, but men who are listening... Is a personalised and inscribed hammer a thing for you? Anyway, with this in hand, the cops think that they've found the last piece of the puzzle, a murder weapon. The only problem is that Fred disagrees with this construction of them as warring lovers. He maintains that, as the letter from Inga had intended, things had been smoothed over. And more critically, he has a pretty airtight alibi. Fred's account of that day is as follows. He stayed over at Inga's the night before and had breakfast with her before leaving around 7.45am for a lecture on campus. He messages her at 8.43 and they agree to meet on campus at 10am, which is when she gives him that letter. He leaves campus and heads back to his job in Pinelands in Cape Town, stopping via a furniture shop to pick up an item for a friend on the way. The electronic turnstile thingy-mabob at his work has him clock in at 11.08 that morning, and security cameras also pick him up at the same time. Just after getting in, he goes into what is called a work session that runs till 5pm. Seven co-workers vouch for his being there. Even in the lunch break, he is joined by a colleague. He briefly swings by his desk and is logged onto his computer from 1.08 to 1.24pm and during that time he sends a couple of SMSs or text messages to Inga. And then he goes back to that group session that he was a part of. We know that he receives a voicemail at 2.51pm and listens listens to it at 329 and the phone records place him exactly where he is supposed to be in the old mutual building in Pylands. The group session ends at 5. He goes back to his desk, logging in at 5.14pm, and then logging back out for the day at 5.30. Half an hour later, the turnstiles have him leaving, and this too is captured on security camera. He gets home a little after 6, and he and the flatmate Marius take the cupboard that he had picked up the morning to a friend who was actually an ex of Inga's who lived in the same complex that they stayed in. During that process of unloading the little cupboard, his car is actually clamped by security in the complex at 7.30 and unclamped again at 7.45 and then they both go home for the evening and have dinner. Fred texts Inga at around 8 Just a quick, sweet text promising to call her later. He then tries to ring her just after nine, but gets her voicemail. He tries her again a few minutes later, and he sends her a text at 9.31. At 10, he's getting stressed, so he texts you, Anita, to ask her if she has heard from Inga and if she knows where she might be, but she replies saying that she hadn't heard from him. He then calls Inga again one last time, And then her mom again at 10.09pm. 
that's when they get the idea of calling Christo to go check on her, which brings us right back to where the story started. So you can see the problem. We know that Inga was alive and well just after 3pm, and we know that Fred was 40 minutes away in his offices the whole afternoon and interacting with various people that evening. This introduces the prospect of a third person, surely, but the crime scene doesn't appear to corroborate this. Firstly, we know that Inga is a modest dresser, especially around people she doesn't know, which is not about that snarky comment Fred made about her sundress. This is something that her mom says too. But at the time of her murder, she's wearing a pretty skimpy uh, tank and sleeping shorts. Remember, she's found as if she'd been relaxing on the couch with a magazine, not dressed for company, and not up as if she would be if she, there was a friend there and she was entertaining them, or even more alert and covered up as if there'd been a stranger in the house, perhaps another maintenance guy or a tyler. We also know that she's very security conscious, but the security gate was open when Christo got there and the front door closed but unlocked. Finally, a reminder that her keys and cell phone were on the kitchen counter right near the front door, her computer left behind, as well as her bag and wallet. And so this is where the case seems to sit for a while. The police have their eye on Fred and a potential murder weapon, but they just can't find a gap in his alibi timeline at all. Then finally, they have a sort of breakthrough. The cops have finished their fingerprint analysis, and one of them, one of the fingerprints, is a four-finger print that they match to Fred. And it was lifted, they say, from the DVD cover, meaning Fred must have been at the flat after 3 p.m., no matter what the work records and colleagues say, right? They search Fred's home and confiscate, among other things, a pair of shoes that they say matches the tread print found in the bathroom. It's apparent that Fred is about to be arrested, so on the advice of his lawyers, he turns himself in on June 15th. To be clear, when I say he turned himself in, this was about cooperating with the police. He still then, and today, maintains his absolute in innocence. The first couple of trial dates are postponed, as they so often are, but his first appearance in court is October 9th, and during this portion, we hear his alibi information. He's granted bail and the trial resumes in early 2007. And if you thought that things were messy before now, hold on to your butts. Fred's trial is nine months long and during that time the evidence presented by the state, chiefly the shoe print and fingerprint, are the main points of contention. The state says, as we know, that the fingerprint on the DVD case puts Fred at the scene when he has no business being there. But witnesses for the defense include a fingerprint expert who says that there's no way that was lifted from a flat surface like a DVD cover. In his view, the print was likely taken off a curved surface like a drinking glass. He points to the presence of what appears to be a lip print in proximity as well as some dragging in the print, like you'd see if you were holding something with a little heft to it, like a glass. It's this expert's contention that the print was mislabeled, either by accident or perhaps intentionally because of the pressure that was building up around the case. And the cover in question was, get this, returned to the DVD store after the prints lifted, meaning it couldn't be retested in any way. In one of the most shocking moments of the trial, the state's fingerprint guy actually admits that there had been a recent scandal that had seen a bunch of investigators fired for fabricating exactly this kind of evidence in order to keep their own case-closing numbers high. He doesn't suggest that that's the case here at all, but you can hear the astonishment in the judge's reply. He actually stops them and asks the witness to repeat – Yes, fabrication. The bloody shoe print gets a beating in court too, with defense witnesses claiming that not only is it not a match to the high-tech tacky or sneaker the cops took from Fred, 
but that it isn't even a shoe print. His experts also take issue with the ornamental hammer as a weapon, claiming that the wounds don't match. And even if that's too open to interpretation for you, the fact that Inga's DNA is not found on the hammer should give you pause. But it's not all wins for defence. Through the trial, Fred comes off more and more like an angry and controlling boyfriend. For starters, there's the letter, which Fred chose to misrepresent to Inga's parents when they asked about it. Instead of showing them the actual letter, he handed over a little happy love note, probably written at an earlier time. His behaviour immediately following her death is also questionable. He moved into her bedroom in her parents' house for a few days leading up to the funeral, and Juanita says he repeatedly told her that everything would be okay and that he would be their kid now. There's actually a lot of extra detail that I'm choosing to leave out here. I understand that the defence in a trial has a job to do, and as part of that they may choose to suggest alternative suspects and motives. I get it. But some of the stuff they present to court is so wildly speculative and inflammatory, so quickly disputed, that it's not worth mentioning in my opinion. One small thread that is worth sort of talking about a little bit is the idea that the police did briefly look into potential guilt of other people, including someone who confessed to the murder. This person was a drug dealer and says that he and some friends were doing a deal in the Shiraz complex, but that it went wrong. And depending on which version of his you believe, either he or his friends killed Inga. The problem with this guy is that he's wrong about virtually every detail he offers the cops. There's no evidence whatsoever that Inga used drugs of any kind at any time, and he gets the date and the location of the flat wrong in his account. Even his description of how Inga died doesn't match. He talks about seeing blood running down her arms, but there was no blood on her arms. And finally, he wasn't even able to pick Inga out of a photo lineup. Despite that, it is tempting to believe that a strung-out dealer and user could be wrong about all of that and still have done it. But then I would point you back to Inga in her pyjamas, relaxing in her flat and reading a magazine, and the valuables in grabbing distance of the front door. Ultimately, the judge concludes that the state has failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, and Fred van der Fever is acquitted of the murder of Inga Lotz on the 29th of November, 2007. The judge lays the blame squarely with the police and faulty forensic methodology. There are two short legal postscripts to mention. Firstly, her parents, still convinced of Fred's guilt, bring a civil case against him, but in the end drop the case. And Fred sues the police for malicious prosecution, He wins this, but it is overturned on appeal. Fred's kept his head down ever since. He works as an actuary, and he's married. No one else has ever been seriously implicated in this case, and there are still many, many people in the country who believe that Fred got away with murder. Two guys, who are typically described in media as amateur sleuths, have published two books and that website, Truth for Inga, on this case, using their own examination of the evidence and that of various academics and experts. They are firmly on team The Boyfriend Did It. And still over a decade later, they participate in discussions about the case online. There's a Reddit thread on this case from four years ago, and one of the brothers, CJ Mollett, wrote in reply to the initial post, quote, To be very clear, there is no evidence of any kind whatsoever that the fingerprint that incriminated Fred came from a drinking glass. In fact, independent analysis by two university professors found that the print came from a flat surface. The fingerprint came from the DVD cover, which put Fred at the scene of the crime at the time of the crime. In our book, we we thoroughly debunk the possibility that the crime was committed by a drug dealer. The Wolverines are not relevant too. The alibi is worth noting. Key alibi witnesses got the date wrong. Their statements were taken by private detectives working for Fred's father two months after the murder. 
Fred was basically forced to testify because the court didn't think much of the alibi witnesses. Now, honestly, there's a lot wrong with this statement. I'm sure that there's things that they have got right over the years, but the idea that there's no evidence that the fingerprint was taken from a drinking glass is simply not true. There are multiple experts on both sides who have testified repeatedly, both in court and in private contributions and in the media, that it came from a flat surface and that it came from something curved like a glass. Clearly, there's no consensus. And the idea that Fred was basically forced to testify, that's CJ Mollett's words, because the court didn't think much of the alibi witnesses, is again conjecture. It doesn't prove what Mollett seems to be implying it it proves. The Wolverine that he mentions refers to something that came up in 2013, around the time that Fred's lawsuit was being appealed. It's a rumour that a group of friends of Fred and Inga's were in some clandestine group or club of men who may or may not have had some secret gay leanings. This is dredged up by a private investigator working for the Lotzes out of email correspondence from a bunch of guys. And it's frankly silly. Who cares if these young men are gay or bi or straight? And if they want to make stupid flirty and sexual jokes in their private correspondence... Again, who cares? Especially since there's absolutely no indication that Fred was ever part of the group. Honestly, the tone in which the Wolverine stuff is reported really upset me. It's sort of trading on not-so-subtle homophobia. So where does that leave you and me, my lovelies? I have to confess that I came to this case believing that Fred was guilty, and I'd just poke a few holes in his alibi to settle it. But it's not been that easy. Critics like the Mollett brothers like to point out this um, this point that the witnesses at work were investigated two months after the fact. But it's not like they would be accessing that memory path for the first time two months down the line. Much more likely, they would have heard the next day or very soon after that their co-worker's girlfriend had been killed. And unless all seven of them are as guileless and trusting as puppies, they would have thought back to that afternoon. And that doesn't account for the turnstile and computers and cell phone towers that all back him up. If we are to believe that perhaps Fred had her killed, then we have to ask if Inga let that hired gun, some stranger, into her house before laying down on her couch and picking up a magazine. So maybe someone was there waiting for her, Okay, but he didn't come through the windows that were secured with burglar bars, so let's say he picked the locks or somehow acquired a key. It's a small flat, not a lot of places to hide. But if we make some uncomfortably large leaps, we can just about imagine a scenario like this, which brings me back to why. Does a jealous and controlling boyfriend hire someone to take out his girlfriend? Usually, in that case, we'd see someone snap and inflict pain themselves. And would a professional kill with such rage and overkill? Let's abandon all reason for a second and imagine that Fred is so smart, he's managed to find a way around the logins on his computer and the security of the building and his co-worker's memories and the cell phone data. He's gone to Inga's house and attacked and murdered her, cleaned himself up, got out of the complex and back to Cape Town in an improbable hour. He's that smart, but he stupidly leaves a clear fingerprint on the one thing in the house that he shouldn't have touched if he wasn't there at that time. And then he drove around for a month with the murder weapon in his car, knowing the police are looking directly at him. For me, it just takes too many leaps of faith and reasoning. I don't like his behavior with her and after her death, but I can't see a straight line from that through all the other evidence to reach the conclusion that he did it. I just can't. If you can think of anything I'm overlooking, please tell me. The best I can offer you in theories right now is that idea of a third player, an unknown, not to Inga, but to us. If that's the case, I'm inclined to say, 
We will never know what went down in 21 Shiraz, not unless someone comes forward with new information. In the classic Agatha Christie-style murder mysteries, there is often the problem of a locked room. How did the murderer get in? How did they get out? In this case, we have an unlocked one, but no less of a mystery. Thanks for listening to It Happened Here. My name is Kate Thompson-Davey, and this is a Ready Freddy production.